Hello all and welcome to the March Patch Tuesday webcast. We will begin in just a few short moments, but before we do, I'd like to remind all attendees that they're currently in listen only mode. But please feel free to ask questions of our panelists at any time and we will answer them during the live Q&A session at the end. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Rob Brown. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another March Patch Tuesday. Um, we're almost uh, 12 months in around uh, since uh, we first started in June last year. Uh, it's been a really amazing, amazing year, and these um, webcasts have helped us um, to develop the kind of content we're delivering uh, to you via these um, mediums. And as usual, I'm invite, I've invited um, some experts from my team uh, to help me today, uh, one of which is uh, John Cassell. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Hey, everybody, my name is John Cassell, Senior Solutions Architect with Sixth Sense, uh, based in sunny Southern California. Been in IT for uh, many years, specializing in desktop, server operations, and at Sixth Sense, I dabble in pre-sales, customer onboarding, and training. Thank you, John. And uh, once again, my name is Rob Brown, um, head of uh, customer success from our uh, UK head office. One of the departments is uh, patch management managed services. And over the last um, 15 years, we've deployed over 100 million patches. So I want to uh, cover off some feedback. Um, we've had some brilliant feedback over the last um, three or four months uh, and a lot of this feedback has been around the length of these um, webcasts and as we announced last last month we're going to try to restrict these to about 50 to 55 minutes we know your time is very precious um, now every single webcast is recorded and will be sent to you following uh, following its conclusion um, you don't have to join live so we will send everybody that um, subscribes to it a copy we have a lot of questions on vulnerabilities. Now, last month we um, we mentioned about vulnerabilities that are not patch related. So you have a vulnerability where you can deploy a patch, and you have a vulnerability where you need to reconfigure Windows or uh, configure um, third-party applications to resolve that vulnerability. And often that is quite complex if you're working with PowerShell. We have over the last um, three or four months, been developing a vulnerability solution database, which we're actually going to launch today. That's a really exciting uh, value we're trying to bring, even if you're not a Sixth Sense uh, client. And also lots of questions on reboot behaviors, and especially now as um, there are many users at, at home uh, working remotely, uh, how to get the best success out of your patching strategy if you are not able to enforce reboots. And so we're going to touch that in the next webinar about a strategy on how to ensure the success of patch management with both pre and post reboot requirements. Okay, so we'll cover off some uh, some news and this will be the last month for uh, Legacy Edge. So uh, if you're familiar with Edge, it is a Windows feature and it will become obsolete from April onwards. Uh, you've had the last update for it in uh, in yesterday's Patch Tuesday. So it's really important that you uninstall that feature and go uh, go ahead, go forward with the application based so that you can get patches for that browser. We also had um, a Google Chrome weaponized vulnerability in its stable channel 89.0.4389. Uh, that's really, really important because uh, it was actually weaponized uh, this week and last week. Uh, which actually means that um, pr prior to this Patch Tuesday, you had a lot of work to do. And this has been uh, causing some issues. There were two recalls uh, last week and the week before. Um, these are servicing stack updates um, that uh, when they were released after patching, it would get to about 25 to 30% of the install and then just literally stop working. The two KBs were 5001078 and 79, and they replaced uh, 601392 and 390. It's really, really important that if you have a patching strategy where you're deploying groups of patches together, because servicing stack updates are necessary for the install of patching. We're going to have a slide in a second to cover that. 
uh, that you make sure that those two are not in your deployment, that you replace it with the very latest ones. We also heard, um, I think you pronounced that Excellion. There was an FTA breach. Now Excellion uh, is a piece of software for uh, secured shared folders and data uh, remotely around the world. It seems to be getting worse and worse, um, a bit like the solar winds. We've heard some uh, rather large businesses, so Bombardier and uh, Qualys have actually had uh, some breaches where data was stolen. Uh, it's really important that you have a strategy for third parties uh, third-party software, don't just rely on uh, Microsoft to bring your vulnerabilities via a patch management. You do need to make sure that you're patching your third parties as well. And lastly, I know John has uh, a lot of um, new information on the exchange uh, weaponized attacks that uh, we've experienced for the last week. Uh, actually, so much so that the um, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency issued an emergency directive 2102. Uh, to, as, as, as a seriousness of this vulnerability. So I'm sure John will give us some fantastic feedback on that. So John, would you like to take us through what third parties and other material you've been working on? Yeah, absolutely, thanks Rob. I uh, just wanna uh, always cover this every time, of course. Uh, third party updates are just as important as operating system updates um, to remedy potential vulnerabilities. Since uh, last month, multiple updates have been released to resolve various issues. Uh, first, and most recently, Adobe released updates for various products since last month's webinar. Specifically, there were critical flaws detected in Adobe Connect, Creative Cloud, and FrameMaker, all affecting Windows installations. Uh, multiple critical and important severity bugs resolved in uh, Adobe Connect specifically. One critical flaw was related to improper input validation which could allow for arbitrary code execution, as well as uh, three important cross-scripting flaws, which could also allow for arbitrary JavaScript execution in the victim's browser if exploited. Uh, Adobe Connect version 11.0.5 and earlier are affected. Uh, there are also three critical vulnerabilities in the desktop version of Adobe Creative Cloud for Windows users. Two of these flaws could enable arbitrary code execution uh, oh, and the third stems from improper input validation and could allow an attacker to gain escalated privileges. Versions 5.3 and earlier of Creative Cloud are affected. Uh, in FrameMaker, Adobe fixed a critical vulnerability which could allow for arbitrary code execution if exploited. Again, sorry for the redundancy. This vulnerability is an out of bounds uh, read error where the software reads uh, data past the uh, end of the intended buffer. An attacker who can read out of bounds memory could potentially gain sensitive values and in turn allowing code execution or denial of service. FrameMaker version 2019.0.8 uh, and below for Windows are affected. Google Chrome has received multiple version updates for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux since last month, as well as resolving a uh, zero day vulnerability we just mentioned at the beginning of March. On March 2nd, Google released version 89 of Chrome with a total of 47 security fixes, ranging from high severity to low severity, and includes resolution for the actively exploited zero day, uh, CVE 2021-21166, which is described as an object lifecycle issue in audio, according to Google. Google labeled the vulnerability as a high severity flaw and stated that, uh, to quote them, access to bug details and links may be kept restricted until a majority of users are updated with a fix. Uh, Google went on to state that they will also retain restrictions if the bug exists in a third party library that other projects similarly depend on but haven't yet fixed. On that note, uh, I would also like to include the other Chromium based browsers such as Microsoft Edge, uh, which followed suit by releasing updates immediately after regarding the same vulnerabilities. So even though we talk about Chrome, of course, any other Chromium browser is also affected here. The same release of Edge also provided taskbar and start menu, shortcut updates and fixes, improved browser performance with sleeping tabs, improved the text selection experience in PDF documents, and now kiosk mode enables additional lockdown uh, capabilities. Mozilla Firefox and Thunderbird, I tend to group these together now if they ever come up just because a lot of the updates are of course shared as well uh, be uh, between Mozilla's Firefox and Thunderbird uh, applications. They received multiple updates since last month. 
Firefox version 86 was released in February and included multiple security fixes um, ranging from high to low severity. Some of these uh, fixes include issues with destination redirects, HTML sanitizer bypass, and potential spoofing in Firefox uh, or Android. The newest version also supports simultaneously watching multiple videos in picture-in-picture -picture mode, total cookie protection in strict mode, improved print functionality, and Firefox users in Canada can now rely on credit card management and autofill. Regarding Thunderbird, versions 78.8 and 78.8.1 were released in February uh, as well as Monday of this week, respectively. The February release resolved the same high severity security issues as with Firefox, uh, just mentioned, and included a number of interface enhancements. The newest version uh, from this week also included various fixes such as open PGP errors and calendar books. Last but not least, I just wanted to highlight Notepad++ version 7.9.3 uh, for Windows. Uh, I thought this was interesting. Uh, it's an interesting release because it's the first from their team that will no longer support the Windows XP or Server 2003 framework and is now strictly Windows Vista or later. Uh, shouldn't come as a surprise to most. Hopefully none are really using that if anyone, but he is still running those operating systems. I'd of course first recommend to migrate to a newer and supported version of Windows instead of worrying about no longer having support from Notepad++. Uh, but that again is an additional reason to not use the old versions because of course most applications are not going to support. Some additional products have also seen updates since last Patch Tuesday, including Citrix, Dropbox, LibreOffice, Malwarebytes, Opera, RingCentral, Skype, WebEx, and Zoom. And of course, lastly, my monthly reminder to all administrators, always include third-party updates uh, and patching in general, of course, in the patch management process. It's not just about the operating system updates. Uh, any application can be considered a major vulnerability if not handled regularly. That's fantastic, John. Thank you very much. And actually, just to add to that, um, we normally have um, uh, a small a small area of this um, webcast dedicated to something uh, that we'd like to to teach you. Um, and uh, last month we covered off five of the highest uh, vulnerabilities that affect Windows other than um, a patch from Microsoft. And as I mentioned right at the beginning, you know, we've been we've been discussing and we've had a lot of feedback from clients that they they are they are there's a lot of anxiety around re, uh, resolving vulnerabilities, how to do it when it's not a patch, when it's a configuration, is it it could be a PowerShell, it could be a setting or it could be a software update. And actually how can um, our customers and uh, how can IT managers manage those vulnerabilities in a safe way. And so Sixth Sense Leadership actually did decide that we would publish uh, our Sixth Sense Secure Vulnerability Database to uh, our website uh, so that if you have these vulnerabilities in your environment, you can search for them and then you can use our advice that's published on this database to actually resolve the vulnerabilities. I'm going to give you a sneak peek of it. It's going to be available from our website. Uh, it will be accessed via a resources section, and this is probably going to go live uh, by the end of the week. And what this is, uh, what this is going to give you is a portal into our database of all of the vulnerabilities, not only patches, but also Windows vulnerabilities as well. You have a search facility, so you can go ahead and search for anything you like, uh, but we do have them grouped by vulnerability types, or you might call these families. So from browser extension vulnerabilities to antivirus, crypto mining, firewalls, and, and things like that, there's going to be an awful lot of content in here and a lot of advice that we can offer via this mechanism uh, to, to, help, to help everyone really resolve their vulnerabilities, especially as we are gearing towards returning users back to the office post-COVID. So if you were to go into any of these families, as you see, we've got antivirus. Uh, we have all of the supported antivirus listed on the page. And on the left-hand side, we have all of the other families that we support. And I'll take you through some of those now. So up in the right-hand corner, if you do find any of these pages useful, 
please feel free to use the share to um, uh, social media. You can bookmark any of these that you like. And along the left, as I mentioned, uh, we do have the families listed. I'll just take you through a couple of these examples, and there will be an awful lot of content in here for you to uh, to review. But if we just take a look at, let's see, you working. We might come back to that actually. There we go. It's probably because it's from the U. Because I'm from I'm from the UK, so it's a little bit slow. Okay, I think we'll just, uh, here we go. Right, so as I said, you have these families along the left. And uh, if we take a look at maybe one of these, hopefully these will actually start working based on the speed. No, I think what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go straight to the next part. We might come back to that. Okay, so let's talk about uh, Patch Tuesday for March. Uh, as you know, if you're um, if you're new, there is actually more than one Patch Tuesday. There's actually three, potentially four, in a month. You've got uh, five um, non-security vulnerabilities fixed in the first Tuesday of this month where we resolved issues in Access, Office, Outlook, and Project, and that is all for Project um, 2016. There was, interestingly enough, a security update for Office 2010, which actually officially became obsolete, and uh, but they're still releasing updates for them. Yesterday, we had a rather large uh, list of vulnerabilities fixed, uh, 89 in total with uh, no .NET Framework vulnerabilities fixed, which actually is in the third uh, Patch Tuesday of the month. So the third Tuesday is normally reserved for .NET Framework previews. And also we had one out of band, six zero days, and an advisory to look at as well. So the advisory is the servicing stack. So servicing stack, as we mentioned right at the front, they're not actually patches. They are critical in nature because they provide the foundation for uh, patch installs. So you need to make sure that your device has the servicing stack installed so that patches are installed successfully. And as you saw, uh, for different servicing stacks, different operating systems have different servicing stacks. It's very important that you make sure that those servicing stacks are installed. Now in this Patch Tuesday, we had servicing stack updates for Windows 10 only which uh, covered feature updates 1809, 1909, 2004, and 2009. So uh, other operating systems do have servicing stack updates such as the server operating system. However, we, we encourage our clients to upgrade to uh, Windows 10 2004 as soon as possible because they actually are going to bundle the servicing stack updates in with cumulative updates. So once you get to uh, 2004, you won't need to worry about uh, putting the servicing stack on, on your machine separately, but you do need to make sure uh, that if you don't have that feature update, that you are in fact ensuring that you have the latest one installed. So how are we gonna prioritize Patch Tuesday? And we are uh, an advocate of a CVSS scoring system but we also use the vendor severity. So we take the vendor severity uh, to, um, uh, to, to for which generally is from critical, medium, high, medium, low, to the CVSS score, which, which is a number, which ranges from uh, 10 to zero, with 10 being the worst. If you put those together, you sort of have an idea, um, a sort of an independent uh, score of the severity at that point. We also have, uh, weaponization and public aware. Now, weaponization is where you have uh, a vulnerability that is uh, actively being exploited. And active exploited is, is, is sometimes what we call a zero day vulnerability. Now, public aware vulnerabilities means that the code, it doesn't mean the vulnerability exists uh, that you have a patch for, it actually means the precise method to expose the vulnerability exists. And so from, uh, so from that, uh, regard, uh, you actually have a sort of a head start that 
if the code exists and you let your fingers do the walking, you can find exactly how to exploit a vulnerability. So we use public aware as a way of saying, here is a head start. Let's get the vulnerabilities remediated uh, before they become weaponized. And uh, to counter that, to sort of balance those um, priorities, we have countermeasures. And countermeasures come in two forms. One of them is a mitigation, where you have uh, something like a next generation antivirus or firewall, something that protects your environment so that you don't need to deploy the patch. And then on the other side, we've got a mitigation. Um, so maybe you've got a, a registry key or a workaround that you can apply, a, a registry key or a service that you can stop, and that means you're not liable to the exploit. This is a way of balancing. So if there are countermeasures, some of those countermeasures are definitely easier uh, to, um, to remediate than a, than a large patch. And especially with some of the more uh, Windows server operating systems from the 2016 onwards, some of these patches uh, can actually be very, very huge, maybe 1.8 or 1.9 gigabytes in size. With such large uh, patches, sometimes it's easier just to mitigate via a, a firewall, for example, instead of rolling out uh, instead of rolling out a huge patch. The only thing we can't help you with unless you're a Sixth Sense customer is your exposure. So if your exposure is high and you have all of these other factors, uh, you should uh, definitely be prioritizing these. And all you need to do is from um, our site where we uh, publish these, you can uh, pop your, the CVE number into your tool set and actually start deploying that as soon as possible. As we mentioned, we don't actually put uh, the um, content anymore into the webinar. We actually put it directly on the site and uh, that can actually be emailed to you as well each and every time we upload new content. So on the uh, news page, uh, you'll find a dedicating holding page for uh, Patch Tuesday, but there's loads of other news on here from Linux vulnerabilities that we talk about to zero day vulnerabilities. We're gonna look at the, um, the Patch Tuesday one here. If you already have um, uh, a patching strategy, but you'd like to know if it is best practice, or if you don't have a patching strategy, you'd like to see maybe how we can help you, you can actually do the download here. Uh, or if you have questions outside of that, you can actually talk to uh, our, our techies down here. As I mentioned, this is up on the site. And if you want to, you can subscribe to this uh, page to receive these directly in your mailbox each and every month. Um, and all you do is you enter your details down here, click subscribe, and you'll get that email every time. Now, as we said, um, in this Patch Tuesday, we had 89 fixes. Uh, and in, surprisingly, we had the first Internet Explorer fix since, I think, December, potentially. And it's, uh, it's actually uh, given us a, a very, very high severity vulnerability. It's one of my, my priorities for today. Uh, it's actually weaponized, so it, it is essential that that is prioritized. But we did have updates for pretty much all of the Microsoft Estate from Windows, Azure, DevOps. Um, we also had Edge and Exchange as well. And I think, um, John, you've got some uh, updates on, on the Exchange vulnerability. Maybe we could cover that uh, in a second. Um, but if you're using um, uh, Windows 7, or 2008 R2, and you do subscribe to the extended support, you do have quite a few patches to remediate this month. So this is actually the first time I've seen also that the patches don't match. So generally they release these um, cumulative updates that cover both the operating systems, but in fact, uh, this is the first month for several months I've seen where we have uh, different vulnerabilities fixed. Uh, so for Windows 7, we had five important vulnerabilities fixed, uh, one of them being a, uh, a print error. So when you try to print, it causes an issue. And also uh, Windows 2008, we had one critical and eight important vulnerabilities, one of them being the DNS uh, that I'm gonna mention in a second. Of course, this is uh, the Microsoft recommendations, but we highly recommend that you include your third parties as well. 
So I'm going to mention um, three of um, the vulnerabilities that I'd like you to prioritize, and I'll go through the reasons for that. Uh, the first one is 26411, uh, that is the Internet Explorer memory corruption vulnerability. Uh, now, this vulnerability can be exploited if the user is um, mistaken to run some some old school tactics, um, sort of click the the picture or sending an email, click the link. If you can entice them to click that, then potentially your machine uh, can be taken over. And what's ser and what's why this is serious is that it is both weaponized and public aware. So not only is it um, uh, actually exploited on devices the actual mechanism to exploit specifically is public as well. Even though the CVSS isn't uh, in the nine plus range, which we would call that critical, it is it is awfully important, especially because you have no, no countermeasure available. The uh, risk alert, we call it the six score risk alert. This is the, the vectors that enable us to decide whether this is risky or not. Uh, it can be exploited over any network, both local and across the internet. Attack complexity is low, privileges are none, user interaction is required, and it is known as a jump point, or its scope is yes. Now that means that they can come in through the Internet Explorer code and jump into Windows and start uh, going within the operating system. And those are some of the worst vulnerabilities uh, that, we, that we need to prioritize. Because if you if you look back to what we learned uh, from the Solar Winds uh, uh, vulnerability, that is precisely what they did. They came in through one vulnerability and then they started moving sideways. And if the vulnerability exists like this, then it's something that you should be prioritizing. The second is CVE um, 26867. This is a Hyper-V remote control uh, remote code execution vulnerability. Uh, now, this one uh, could allow um, an authenticated attacker. So it's slightly different. You need an authenticated attack to take place. But, however, the danger is that if you can attack the guest, an attacker could exploit this uh, into the host operating system. Again, so that means that we have the jump point. Um, now, we do have a countermeasure. So this is only going to impact um, Hyper-V where it's configured to use Plan 9 file system. And this is very popular on Linux. It is a CVSS 9.9, .9, critical in nature. And as I mentioned, it can be attacked. It does require um, the, the, um, some, um, uh, some authentication, but if they can gain that, then that's a very, very serious vulnerability, especially as we know a lot of uh, companies are actually running Hyper-V on their laptops, and those are the, uh, the, the secure sandboxed environments that they're using to come back to the corporate network in, in to try to protect their environment. But if you're running that on Linux, for example, and you're running Windows on Linux, in this case, then there is actually a, a huge risk that, uh, that they, they will be able to have a side lateral attack. And lastly, but not least, uh, we're looking at uh, 26897. This is a Windows uh, DNS server remote co code execution vulnerability. Um, this is very serious. This is 9.8. Uh, it does have a countermeasure. Uh, so this one is if an attacker can send us a, a specifically crafted request and it can, they can execute arbitrary code on the target system, which may result in complete compromise of the vulnerable system. And uh, the countermeasure for this one is that you need to have dynamic updates enabled. So if you don't have dynamic updates enabled, I'm not sure how many of you will not have this enabled, but if you don't have this enabled, uh, then that is a countermeasure. So it's less risky in your environment. Uh, as I mentioned, all of the vulnerabilities from Patch Tuesday has uh, has been um, scored with each of the, the factors that we um, with each of the factors that we use here and uh, i invite um john if you won't mind have you um been looking at any of these uh, vulnerabilities that you'd like to mention today yeah quite a few i'd like to highlight actually um a few from this list and then i want to speak a little bit more about the uh, exchange uh, out of band updates especially uh cve's uh 2021 26412 
and uh, 26855. Uh, Microsoft Exchange Server Remote Code Execution Vulnerability for Exchange 2013, 16, and 19. The uh, vulnerability allows a remote attacker to execute arbitrary code on the system. The vulnerability exists due to insufficient validation of user-supplied input. Uh, a remote attacker can send specially crafted data to the Exchange server and execute arbitrary code on the system. The initial attack requires the ability to make an untrusted connection to Exchange over uh, server port 443. This can be protected against by restricting untrusted connections or setting up a VPN to separate the Exchange server from external access. Using this mitigation will only protect against the initial portion of the attack. Other portions of the chain can be triggered if an attacker um, already has access uh, or can convince an administrator to open a malicious file. Uh, this has a vendor severity of critical and a uh, industry severity uh, of critical CVSS score of 9.1. Uh, it has been weaponized, so uh, you may have already heard about these particular vulnerabilities. They're quite dangerous. We'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, it is actively exploited in the wild. Uh, public was not aware previously, and no countermeasures are offered. Uh, the six score risk alert uh, attack vectors over the network. This can be exploited uh, by remote uh, authenticated privilege user via the internet. Uh, attack complexity is low, uh, privileges are high, uh, no user interaction required. Um, and a uh, jump point uh, can, uh, can be leveraged in this point. Um, also wanted to highlight a little bit about the other updates, uh, what's been going on with Exchange specifically. Um, of course, they have released uh, security updates for unsupported versions of Exchange as well, uh, following these widespread attacks, exploiting four newly discovered security vulnerabilities. Uh, they already released out-of-band emergency updates, of course, for 2013 Exchange 16 and 19, but in light of the ongoing cyber attacks exploiting the flaws, they also rolled out updates for previously end-of-life products. This is certainly worth noting as Microsoft uh, obviously does not release uh, any updates for unsupported products, except in the case of a rare event such as this. Uh, in 2017, of course, they released updates for the unsupported XPOS related to the WannaCry ransomware, and again in 2019 after identifying a severe wormable flaw. Uh, recently, Microsoft stated that they are producing an additional series of security updates that can be applied to some older and unsupported cumulative updates. The availab availability of these updates does not mean that you don't have to keep your environment current. I mean, of course, just because they released updates for old versions of Exchange, upgrade unsupported versions as soon as possible to maintain full support going forward. Uh, they did go on to state that this is intended only as a temporary measure to help protect uh, vulnerable machines right now. Still need to update to the latest uh, supported cumulative update and apply the applicable security updates. Now, if you're already met update to a later cumulative update, you should continue with that update. Also, as mentioned briefly earlier, the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, uh, issued another warning yesterday for organizations to apply Microsoft's updates, stating uh, CISA urges all organizations across all sectors, uh, highlight of all over all, uh, to follow guidance uh, to address the widespread domestic and international exploitation of Microsoft Exchange Server product vulnerabilities. An adversary can exploit this vulnerability, uh, or rather in this case, of course, multiple vulnerabilities, to compromise your network and steal information, encrypt data for ransom, or even execute a destructive attack. So, uh, of course, if it isn't clear already, uh, if this does apply to you, make sure that you deploy it as soon as possible. And if you're running old versions, even though they are temporarily supported uh, of Exchange, do make sure that you uh, figure out a plan to upgrade that particular role as soon as possible. That's, that's brilliant, John. I did I did see though that uh, Microsoft has said that the Office 365 as uh, web platform doesn't actually uh, have a vulnerability. Uh, it is just premise based. Is that is that still the case? Yeah, in my findings, it was based, it was premise-based uh, installations. Yeah, and I think probably before for COVID, probably premise servers were still very, very popular, and I imagine they probably are still very, very popular. So yeah, that's brilliant advice. Thank you, John. Okay, uh, issues, uh, some very serious ones we need to mention um, that we've actually been learning uh, from from some of our clients, but also some feedback from. Uh, some of our uh, webinar emails that we sent before. Uh, these ones, however, um, uh, it's the same. Uh, Microsoft has said that certain operations may fail on clustered shared volumes with uh, with the Windows 7 and 2008 R2 vulnerabilities. 
um, Microsoft are recommending that you take extra precautions during your testing. And this one, uh, this is actually something that uh, is brand new. We've only seen uh, announcements on this. It's KB5000802 um, is causing blue screen of death. Um, blue screen, black screen, if you're using uh, this Kyocera printer. Now, I've also found a few articles where other printers are affected. Uh, there is no fix from those uh, companies yet on, on, on a new driver. However, uh, we do recommend that you postpone the deployment of that patch until you've done your testing or until uh, new drivers are provided by those printer companies. We also have um, the uh, user certificates uh, getting lost when you update. That's typically if you don't install the uh, most appropriate SSU updates prior to installing uh, those updates. So it's very, very important uh, because once you lose your certificates, uh, you can't get them back unless you restore the operating system. And then lastly, this one's here quite a lot. This is the uh, Microsoft Japanese input method editor. Sometimes the characters don't display properly. They are, and Microsoft is still working on a solution. Now, if you um, if you are using Windows 10 Home and Pro, um, John, we have some feedback on um, on uh, the future life of those feature updates that you're using. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there aren't uh, any changes from the uh, previous month, but there's something to look forward to very shortly uh, this year. Um, in May, uh, especially as we see on the screen, uh, the consumer versions, Home and Pro of Windows 10, uh, if you're running 1909, uh, it will be coming to an end. Um, because I believe, yes, okay, so it's on the next slide. Uh, so yes, if you if you are on 1909 again, it will be coming to an end uh, very shortly. So do make sure you figure out a plan. And as recommended at this point, 2004 or later would be a, a great option to go with. Although, from what you see on this slide, even if you go to 2004, you've only got an additional uh, six or seven months or so uh, until you'll have to upgrade again. So um, 20H2 is also available, of course, that is the latest uh, revision. And so far I've heard pretty good reviews about it. So would recommend even if you have the ability, go to the latest. We'll give you the longest uh, support. Uh, and then the next slide, Ross. Yeah, and then uh, for business versions, uh, business editions, enterprise and education, of course, typically you're gonna get a longer life cycle on these. Uh, the last year and a half has been quite interesting with Microsoft extending a number of these versions. As you see on the bottom of the list, um, we kind of have a bit of a gap in terms of support. Um, a later version, as we see here, 1903 is already uh, marked as unsupported, but older versions are still supported until May as well. Uh, 1803, 1809 for enterprise were extended um, during uh, the uh, beginning of the pandemic to make it easier for administrators to deploy their versions, but they will also be coming to an end in May. And 2004 actually for um, for business editions, um, sorry Rob, is that correct? Until 2021, might be the year after for version 2004. Uh, I'll double check on that. Um, oh, 2004 is of course a spring release, so it doesn't get the, uh, the same life cycle. So yes, uh, that will also be coming to an end at the end of the year. Uh, but you can actually go with the version before if you have Enterprise, again, very different from Pro, uh, Homer Pro versions, the 1909 version for Enterprise will still have life, uh, uh, continued support well into 2022. Yeah, and this is due to the COVID and, uh, you know, Microsoft being worried about the enormous deployments that would take place if users from home were forced into uh, deploying such huge updates. Of course, as we mentioned before, feature updates are not patches, they are actually Windows upgrades. So it's taking you to pretty much a brand new version of Windows. So there's, and there's certainly a lot more planning and strategy that you need if you are going to uh, do a deployment because it could take up to an hour and a half just to apply it. So thanks to Microsoft, they extended some of these, but some of these versions, if you're on these, uh, you really don't have a lot of time. And I think uh, I think I read somewhere that, is it 18 months general? You've got a general life cycle every 18 months, you'll be going through the Windows feature update upgrades. I think that's what I've heard. Uh, yeah, 18 months for enterprise. And what we've seen in the past few years is that Microsoft is changing uh, the life cycle for, you know, between fall and, and spring releases. 
the um, spring release will have a shorter life cycle and the fall will have a longer life cycle. So you'll get the extra amount of time on a, uh, on a fall release. Spring release will pretty much have a very similar uh, end date with Pro. Yeah. And for everyone, uh, everyone watching, this is actually all uh, American uh, date format. I actually mixed them up a couple of sessions ago because <laughs> I read them wrong. So these are all American formats, uh, but they're all available from this location. So if you pop that URL into your browser, you can actually get the very latest details. And we just have one I've just marked uh, orange, which is your 2016 LTSB, which uh, comes to main, mainstream support. Uh, later on this year. Okay, so let's go back to our website. Um, we actually have all of the Linux vulnerabilities up on our site as well. We actually do release um, uh, vulnerabilities for Linux every single week. So typically on a Monday, at the very latest on a Tuesday. The reason is uh, uh, for the Microsoft Patch Tuesday, they typically release them uh, on the first, second, and third Tuesday, it's generally fixed unless it's known as as, uh, as an out of band update. But for Linux, the cadence is much much faster, so they may actually fix a kernel update this week for Red Hat, and then next next week they might actually update it again. So we do actually like to keep on top of Linux where we can. Uh, but what we've done is we've taken our top vulnerabilities of the entire month, so the whole month of February. We popped it on our site, and I think John, you'd like just to go through uh, some of these ones for us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you want to point out before going through the list that uh, I've ordered these in terms of the industry severity uh, based on the CVSS score? Uh, one thing that's quite common, uh, which we discussed when looking at Linux, of course, the different manufacturers and distributions, is that there's going to be a bit of kind of mixed um, mixed ratings here. Uh, the first I'd like to highlight is a, a buffer overflow uh, impacting Python 27, 36, and 38. The vendor in this case has provided a severity of medium. Although this, this is the first one on my list, so it has the highest severity, CVSS score of 9.8. Uh, Stack-based buffer overflow was discovered in the C types module provided within Python. Applications that use this without carefully validating the input past it may be vulnerable to this flaw which wouldn't allow an attacker to over, uh, overflow a buffer on the stack and crash the application. Um, this uh, uh, six core risk alert, this vulnerability has a critical risk as this can be exposed over any network with low complexity, no privileges, and without user interaction. The next update, uh, Xterm uh, vulnerability within Ubuntu 20.1, 20.04, 18.04, 16.04, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8. Uh, vendor severity in this case, medium slash important, although second on my list, still has a very high score, 9.8 uh, CBSS. Uh, and in this case, Xterm incorrectly uh, handles certain character sequences. A remote attacker could use this issue to cause uh, Xterm to crash, resulting in a denial of service or possibly uh, execute arbitrary code. The six core risk alert. Uh, this vulnerability has a critical risk as this can be exposed over any network with low complexity. Uh, again, no privileges and without user interaction. Next update would be a screen update for SUSE Enterprise Server uh, 12 Service Pack 2 to 12 Service Pack 5. In this case, they have provided a vendor severity of important, although um, the CVSS score is 9.8. I'd like to point out that might actually be under review, uh, but still at the moment does have a, quite an extremely high uh, CVSS score. Um, fixed double width combining character handling uh, UTF-8 character that could lead to a denial of service or code execution. Uh, our uh, six score risk alert, this vulnerability again has a critical risk as it can be again exposed over any network with again no complexity, uh, sorry low complexity, no privileges and without user interaction. The next update is for Mozilla Thunderbird. Now, of course, uh, when I go over third-party updates, many of those could apply towards Linux as well, uh, but just to uh, specify this one directly. Uh, the vendor, in this case, Mozilla, provided a severity of important, although it has a CVSS score of 8.8. .8. So just below the critical mark, but it still has a high severity, as mentioned uh, previously, when going through the Thunderbird um, changes. Memory safety bugs present in Firefox 85 and uh, Firefox um, uh, extended uh, release 78.7. Uh, 
Some of these bugs showed evidence of memory corruption, and we presume that with enough effort, some of these could have been exploited to run arbitrary code. Um, and since Firefox and Thunderbird are pretty much the same framework, of course, it would affect either. Uh, six Sense, or sorry, Six Score Risk Alert. This has a high risk, but it can still be exposed over any network with low complexity, no privileges, but does require user interaction in this case. The last update to highlight, kernel update for Oracle uh, Linux 6 and 7. In this case, Oracle's provided a vendor severity of important. CVSS score is uh, lower in this case, 7 point, but any CVSS score, of course, should be concerning. Uh, Zen is vulnerable to a denial of service caused by error handling and mapping. Local attacker could exploit this vulnerability to crash the corresponding backend driver, potentially affecting the entire domain running that backend driver. Our uh, risk alert, this does have a moderate risk as it can be exposed over a local network with low complexity, no privileges, and again, without user interaction. Uh, that's brilliant, John, thank you. I think we just have a little update for Mac OS as well. <laughs> yeah, some information for Mac. Uh, this week, Apple pushed out security updates for a memory corruption bug to devices uh, running on iOS, Mac OS, Watch OS, and for Safari. If exploited, uh, this high severity vulnerability could could allow remote attackers uh, to completely compromise effective sy affected systems. This vulnerability has a CVSS score of 7.7 .7 out of 10, of course, but don't let that lower your priority. Update any Mac OS devices as soon as possible to ensure that they are secure. Uh, there was also a Safari version uh, release. Again, Apple has released um, a new version for Mac OS, Catalina and Mojave users. That's brilliant, John. Thank you. All right. I think what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll head back to Heidi to see if um, we have any questions that we can answer, and I might see if I can uh, bring up the uh, the solution database if it is going to work for me. Whilst uh, Heidi, you'd like to ask uh, any any questions so far? Yeah, absolutely. We have a few, and there's still time if anybody wants to use the chat feature to ask them while we're answering these other ones. Feel free. Um, and if we don't get to your question, we will reply in an email as well. So feel free to ask. The first one is, um, if the operating system is up to date, but my Office version is no longer supported, why do I need to patch it? Right, okay. Um, so we, obsolete software uh, actually poses two risks. The first one is that uh, with the code being no longer supported by the vendor, it means that you have a, a, a potential huge amount of time that uh, hackers can actually start trying to uh, to expose the code in that version, knowing that you're not going uh, to be patching it any further. That being said, um, we have seen uh, Microsoft provide fixes for software known as out of band. Um, for Office 2010, even though it was officially not supported, but that doesn't mean they're always going to do it. It really is based on the the risk that Microsoft see at the time, whether or not they're actually going to re -re release a fix for an obsolete version. But it's very, very important that you do so. Just because uh, that version is out of date doesn't mean that hackers aren't trying to to weaponize threats with that version. As I always mentioned as well, it's not just about the operating system. Make sure you push out any application updates as well. Uh, they can be, in some cases, even more critical than what the OS um, may have flaws with. Great, guys. Um, next question is, uh, which unsupported Exchange versions also received updates? Realize I may not have actually said that version. Uh, Exchange uh, Server 2010. So I won't go for any older versions from that, but they did, uh, again, as mentioned earlier, provide updates for an unsupported version, and that is for 2010. Thank you. Um, also, is Flash going to be in 21H1? <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's not. Um, uh, ironically, although Flash became end of life at the beginning of the year, 20H2, was the feature update released at the end of last year, which actually did include uh, Flash within it. So if you're so if you have uh, uninstalled Flash already, 
but you are planning to upgrade feature update to last year's feature update, uh, you will actually need to re-uninstall Flash again, I'm afraid. So, but it won't be in uh, 21 H1. It, it's it's confirmed by Microsoft. It will not be in that version. Okay, thank you. And then this is the last question we have, unless anybody wants to add more to the chat. Um, next one is, what makes a patch a zero day? Okay, um, so zero day is actually, the, the word zero day is really where you've got a vulnerability where you have no time uh, or you have very little time to start resolving it. And it's really based on those statuses. So if you have something that is currently weaponized, that's where you may find it being called a zero day. Now, sometimes it's zero day and sometimes it's the, the, numbers, uh, the letter z uh, number zero and then zero day, but both of them mean exactly the same thing. It means the vulnerability is being exploited and you may have a patch, or you may not have a patch. So where you have a zero day vulnerability where the patch does not exist, you will need something like what I'm looking at on the screen here is an alternative. So you're applying a setting, changing something, uninstalling software, or you have mitigations such as a, a next generation antivirus that would actually mean that you're not uh, susceptible to it. Those are the really very dangerous vulnerabilities that are zero day where a patch doesn't actually exist. That's great. That's all the questions um, from the audience. That's fantastic. Well, we really appreciate um, your time um, with us today. As I mentioned, this is going to be recorded and it will be published for everybody. If you would love uh, to subscribe, you'll get this uh, in an email, plus also a copy of the recording as well via email. Uh, we hope that um, uh, some of the patches we've highlighted this week will help you prioritize your Patch Tuesday strategy. And of course, for the uh, until until the next time, we wish you happy patching. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Yes, bye.